Hello, welcome to the Ukrainian Studies Organization at Indiana University. I'm Natalia Shpilova Said, and joining me today is Anya Braman. We are delighted to welcome today our speaker, Dr. Sergei Zhuk, with a presentation on the KGB versus youth culture, a history of hippies and punks in Soviet Ukraine. Sergei Zhuk is professor of history at Ball State University. A former Soviet expert in U.S. history, Dr. Istorichnik Nauk, he moved in 1997 to the United States, defended his American PhD dissertation about imperial Russian history at Johns Hopkins University in 2002. His research interests are international relations, especially U.S.-Russia relations, knowledge production, cultural consumption, religion, popular culture and identity in a history of the United States, Imperial Russia, Ukraine, and the Soviet Union. His recent publications include Soviet Americana, the cultural history of Russian and Ukrainian Americanists, which was published 2018. Nikolai Balhavitinov and American Studies in the USSR, People's Diplomacy in the Cold War, uh, 2017, and Rock and Roll in the Rocket City, the West Identity and Ideology in Soviet Dnipropetrovsk, 1960-1985, which was published in 2010. Currently, Sergei Zhuk is writing a book about the KGB special operations against the US and Canada in Soviet Ukraine, 1953-1991. We will start with Dr. Zhuk's lecture. Please submit your comments and questions via the Q&A option, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, and Sergei Zhuk will address those during our Q&A session. Uh, welcome, Sergei. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And um, uh, this is um, uh, this is theme um, of a young people um, and who are suppressed by KGB, persecuted by KGB is major topic of my book because um, my book is um, uh, not just about operations, KGB operation, but also reasons for this and for the results, for future results. Uh, for entire Ukraine. Unfortunately, these results are not very good. And um, uh, to some extent, um, uh, my book is uh, a sequence of, to, to my previous project, Rock and Roll's Rocket City, about culture consumption, where I used uh, also KGB documents, but only from um, uh, Dnipropetrovsk archives. And uh, uh, Another book, Soviet Americana, about uh, influences of American products, American uh, uh, culture on uh, uh, Soviet Ukraine and uh, Soviet Ukraine uh, population. As uh, and when I, when I began my uh, this project um, a couple of years ago, I, I went to archive and uh, KGB archive now at SBU archive. And I finally found what I was looking for, my Rock and Roll and Rocket City. It's paradox that in uh, uh, 2008 or 2007, I forgot, when I needed some additional materials from KGB archives, I went to Kyiv, I went to the same archive and uh, I was rejected actually because I was a professor, although I'm Ukrainian, I'm still, I was a professor in, um, from India, the American professor. And, and, I was denied, denied the success, but uh, uh, then uh, now I got this and I spent uh, six months um, uh, digging there and uh, I realized uh, that I need to come back again uh, to my previous uh, topics of culture consumption because culture consumption in our life, it's a very important theme. It's uh, um, consumption which uh, define and uh, uh, shape our identity. We, uh, we depends on what we read, what we listen to, what we uh, watch uh, uh, on television, um, in the cinemas, uh, on uh, our screen at home. And uh, the more I uh, thought about this, I realized that um, part of my book should be again devoted to this um, uh, topic of culture consumption and identity and how KGB uh, tried to control this. Uh, 
culture consumption in Soviet Ukraine. And again, um, it was related to the same theme, theme of uh, my book, uh, main adversary for Committee of State and Security, Committee of State and Security, Committee of State and Security in the Soviet Union, the main uh, enemy was the United States. And I quote um, one of uh, my uh, source, um, a KGB officer, um, with very good rank, actually, who uh, was part of the KGB system in Soviet Union in the 70s. And he was responsible for some of these operations. For example, he was responsible for arrest of 172 hippies uh, uh, from Kyiv uh, State University. And um, uh, I, I start with his phrase, uh, my conversation today. The capitalist America, I quote, uh, him was always the main real adversary of the Soviet leadership and the KGB after 1945 until the collapse of the USSR. But after the opening of Soviet Ukraine to various Western influences under Khrushchev and especially under Brezhnev, he continued, this adversary, the United States, created a new front inside the Soviet society, affecting the Soviet youth culture. After 1945, the old Ukrainian nationalism, Zionism, and religious sects were the traditional targets of KGB operations in Soviet Ukraine. Since 1968, after the massive participation of Czech youth influenced by American imperialist propaganda in the events of Prague Spring, the new object had appeared for KGB active measures and special operations. This object was Soviet Ukrainian youth culture, which was shaped by alien Western, especially American influence, unquote. Actually, I used this phrase, seductive adversary, for an entire book. And now uh, one part of my book will be about KGB and culture consumption. And young people use culture is very important. It will be not only chapters about what people read. Uh, I will have chapter about Shevchenko, Trashevchenko and KGB, uh, probably people who went to Natalia conference on Shevchenko remember my uh, presentation based on this material. B but uh, um, this part about culture consumption will be devoted to culture of young people of Soviet Ukraine. And two particular uh, cultural movements or subcultural movements uh, in Ukraine uh, will be described in this uh, book. One is Soviet hippies and another is Soviet punks, even in, in Soviet Ukraine. Again, as uh, part of this anti-American campaign uh, organized by KGB. And I explain why it was anti-American and how it was related to ge geopolitical um, problems of the 70s and 80s. Probably many of you know good books written by, um, by Bill Rich about Lviv um, uh, history, including his chapter about uh, Soviet hippies there. Um, probably people know publications by Julian Furst uh, about hippies in uh, Soviet Union. Uh, probably people uh, remember publication films about Estonian or Baltic hippies in the Soviet Union. So we have plenty of material about this, but unfortunately this material, especially publications by uh, uh, Bill Rich and Julian Furst missed um, the, this huge and uh, very important and rich um, depository of documents from SBU archives, um, KGB archives in Kyiv. Plus, I uh, published some material about uh, Soviet punks in uh, Dnipropetrovsk, but still, I had no access in those days, like Bill, uh, Rich, and Julian, to this rich materials from uh, Kyiv. Now I have this material and I, I will use this. And uh, this material revealed that uh, this campaign against these two 
uh, movements of Soviet young people in uh, Soviet Ukraine, hippies and punks, was related to real geopolitical situation of late 60s and early 80s. Um, the first reaction of a KGB to hippie movement uh, took place in 67, 68, and um, uh, KGB all over Ukraine, um, uh, from Lviv to Dnipropetrovsk, from Kyiv to Chernivtsi, uh, collected material about this strange uh, movement of imitation of people who comprise, according to KGB agents, of two sort of uh, guys, one uh, group of people were Fartsovshiki, those who um, traded uh, forbidden uh, products on black market, black market uh, um, records of, of music, jazz, uh, rock music. In those days, it was called beat music in the Soviet official propaganda. And it's one uh, part, uh, and another part was so-called Beatlemani, uh, people who followed the Beatles, Paul McCartney, John Harrison, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, and a uh, combination of these two groups in one created this strange following, uh, which had you know these obvious um, signs of American or British um, hippies. KGB uh, pay attention to uh, this these publications in Vakruk Sveta, in Ravesnik, and other Soviet central uh, media about uh, British and especially American uh, uh, hippies. Ranak and um, other uh, Ukrainian uh, use magazines and uh, uh, newspapers began publishing this material. And KGB tried to understand this phenomena. Um, because on, on the first, uh, surface, this movement was peaceful, although the people in Chernivtsi, in Zaporizhia, in um, Kyiv, and Lviv tried to organize public demonstrations, but peaceful demonstrations against the war in Vietnam. Um, but uh, this emphasis on pacifism was, uh, for KGB, was dangerous because uh, they were afraid that many of these people, and uh, it happened that they were right. Some of them, some of these followers of uh, hippies uh, did this. They tried to avoid service in uh, Soviet army. Uh, but overall it was a peaceful uh, movement and first reaction was not very negative. Uh, was uh, uh, like uh, effort to study this movement. And in uh, 69, um, KGB office in Kiev sent to uh, Petroshelist and the other leaders of a uh, Ukrainian Communist Party uh, this analysis of uh, hippie roots in, in, in America um, as a counterculture movement. And they even uh, republished, and again, they resent to Shellist publication from American journal America in, in a Russian translation of one uh, um, American sociologist, uh, Keniston uh, from Yale, who published a um, series of articles and then book about um, hippie. And um, uh, it, it was, uh, uh, at the beginning, it was very um, uh, peaceful movement for KGB, a KGB try to understand this movement. But then happened Prague Spring and this attempt to reform socialism in Czechoslovakia, 67, 68, um, and uh, reaction of Soviet leadership. By the way, leader of Soviet Ukraine, Petro Shalist, uh, was one of them who uh, united with Andropov, KGB guy, uh, who just took this. Um, uh, uh, position of chair of KGB who tried to suppress this movement to reform social. They were afraid, and Shellis to some extent was right, Shellis was afraid of repetition of or get copying of these events in Soviet Ukraine. Um, what happened and KGB um, analyzed this material from Czechoslovakia that majority of supporters of this uh, reformist movement in Prague and other places in Czechoslovakia where young people, college people who listened to 
uh, beetles to rolling stones to the animals. Some of them call themselves hippies. And this connection to hippie movement um, in Czechoslovakia and this imaginary world of KGB offices produced this immediate negative reaction. After this, uh, after 68, KGB sponsored anti-hippie operations all over from Chernivtsi to Dnipetrovsk, from Lviv to Kiev. Um, they tried to stop any uh, public appearance, public demonstrations of these hippie followers in Zaporizhia, for example, people were stopped uh, in, um, in Kyiv. I already mentioned 172 students of Kyiv University were arrested for imitating of hippie movement in 1972. So in many places uh, in Ukraine, by 1970, Chernivtsi, uh, Dnipropetrovsk, uh, uh, this movement was suppressed. And KGB was afraid of this, uh, not just music following, uh, not just Bitlamania, uh, not even by uh, afraid of Fartsovshi, but uh, black market, but political implication. They were afraid of politicizing of this movement, institutionalization of a movement. Moreover, in many places, like in, uh, in Kirovograd, for example, and in Kyiv, Followers try to create the clubs, uh, for example, Danka Club. But it's interesting, Kirovograd uh, hippies followed um, this traditional adoration of Gorky stories, like Staruha um, Izergil stories, which they started in high school. And they created this Danko Society of Pure Hearts uh, in Kharkiv and Kirovograd. And so Kharkiv and uh, uh, Kirovograd hippies try to institutionalize this. And this is a very dangerous trend because uh, KGB discovered that there was a position to, uh, to come some all, it was uh, alternative to come some of the, especially these Danko Hats um, uh, uh, clubs. Uh, for example, Kharkiv uh, people, uh, these hippies, uh, had the anthem "House of the Rising Sun" by by the animals, uh, and they try to explain um, uh, to KGB officers who arrested them that they followed oppressed part of American population who created the rhythm blues like Muddy Waters, Chuck Berry, all these black musicians who inspired the animals, the Beatles, and Rolling Stones, and so on. So uh, KGB was afraid of this; they tried to suppress, but they eventually failed. And uh, uh, what happened, the uh, KGB officers tried to uh, find any bad material about them. And they found sometimes, uh, for example, one uh, hippie uh, from Kherson, uh, Kherson actual college students idealized Hitler and um, uh, German fascism, Nazi. And this was enough to connect to fascist movement. And you, you need to imagine that in, uh, uh, Soviet uh, propaganda, um, KGB and Soviet ideologists, Komsomol and party ideologists used fascist cliche every time uh, to um, criticize someone, to find uh, something bad. Well, I, I, can, I can read what they found um, uh, about uh, this fascist link. Mm. This uh, Alexander Balikin, a hippie from Nikolaev Shipbuilding Institute, declared that the ideas of Hitler are similar to the ideas of modern youth, which discard such notions as conscience, shame, and morality. And probably many of you remember a pioneering article by my friend Bill Rich about uh, hippies in Kiev who were arrested for their black ties, which were decorated with swastikas and crosses. Actually, this material is in KGB uh, archives as well. And uh, uh, KGB found these uh, uh, fascist connections in Prague, Spring Movement. And all this was connected eventually to American imperialist movement, to CIA movement in KGB imagination. So seductive adversary became very dangerous uh, enemy who undermined Soviet culture, brought these ideas of fascism, 
ideas of alternatives to come somehow and try to destroy uh, this movement from inside. So this was a major idea of KGB uh, operations uh, against the hippie movement, this connection to America, to fascism, and uh, frankly speaking, more practical uh, danger was attempt to create uh, alternative systema, alternative to uh, political organizations of young people in Soviet Ukraine it was more dangerous. And this systema, uh, system of KGB, of, of uh, hippies movement, uh, survived all persecutions. And it's interesting that we have neo hippie movement in the UNP historic in 85, 87, and then even 89. Um, and uh, in those days, these hippies. Uh, not only were against uh, arms, against weapons, against nuclear power because of Chernobyl. They were critical of Soviet position after Chernobyl catastrophe, but they also became patriots. Some groups of these hippies became patriotic uh, followers of Shevchenko, and Shevchenko became another uh, figure like Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, um, all um, these rock and musicians, Shevchenko, Tara Shevchenko became for them symbol of their own hippism, hippism of Ukrainian style. And they survived until 1989. So it's the first movement, uh, which uh, again was related to geopolitical crisis in uh, Soviet bloc, in Warsaw Pact. It was uh, Prague Spring and it was Czechoslovakia events in 1967-68 which was suppressed by Soviet tanks, by Soviet invasion, by Warsaw uh, Pact uh, armies, and many uh, politicians, including Ukrainian, like uh, Petro Shalist, were behind this suppression. And uh, Petro Shalist, like Sherbitsky, uh, were those leaders who tried to suppress this dangerous imitation of Western culture and attempt to recreate Prague Spring in Ukraine. Second movement is um, uh, punk movement. And again, it's a very strange movement for KGB because KGB discovered that uh, Ravesnik and the other uh, Soviet uh, youth press presented uh, first punks of 76, 79, like Sex Pistols, uh, The Clash, Ramones, um, as anti-system, anti-capitalist uh, groups. Um, they praised them. They praised that Clash collaborated with communists against skinheads movement because heavy metal fans, some of heavy metal fans in Britain were fascists, real fascists, and they uh, clashed with um, uh, immigrants. And the Clash and other uh, punk bands uh, who played ska music, African American uh, music, reggae, were. Uh, supporter of uh, anti-racist pro-communist movements in London and other cities. So uh, in the uh, 70s it was okay, but uh, suddenly we, uh, then came Solidarność movement in Poland, Solidarity movement, which began in 79, but peak was in 1980. Again, it was supported by ordinary workers of the trade union movement of Solidarność. Uh, funded by uh, Catholic Church. And many uh, young people in Poland, uh, including college students, supported this movement. Again, rock music became part of this movement. And the KGB discovered that, um, unfortunately, some of uh, these bands in Soviet uh, bloc and socialist countries in uh, Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia and um, uh, in um, Poland, as early as the late 70s, began playing this so called punk music, but with criticism of Soviet communism, comparing to Soviet communism to fascism. They sometimes even, uh, even used um, these images of fascist swastika and so on. Uh, for epitage, for you know, for negative reaction to compare with uh, Red Star of Soviet communist regime, so it became dangerous trend. And uh, when millions of young people in Poland joined Solidarność, supported this, including Klaus Evers, 
reminded that uh, it should be stopped. They were afraid of this uh, imitation in um, uh, Soviet Ukraine. The first arrest connected to this strange music punk, which was supported by official Komsomol, like Clash, um, like Anarchy in Ukraine by, uh, excuse me, in the UK by, by um, uh, Sex Pistols. Uh, all this music became dangerous because of uh, this imaginary connection to Solidarność and this another second crisis in uh, Soviet bloc after Prague Spring of 68. And uh, I found the first arrests, arrests uh, as early as December 1980 in Dnipropetrovsk, in Chernivtsi and other places of uh, those people who tried to play the music of the Clash, um, uh, Sex Pistols and Ramones. And they were immediately compared to skinheads, to fascists in Britain, and they were arrested. Um, their music collection were uh, confiscated disco clubs or disco parties which were organized by these people. Some of them uh, active council members were stopped and it was a uh, uh, difficult and dangerous uh, time. Um, but uh, after 1980, despite of this um, uh, attempt to stop this, um, KGB did not find any um, fascist or neo-Nazi expressions before 1982. In 1982, what happened, uh, Soviet Union released an um, Italian film, very progressive film, by um, Carlo Lizzani, it was a um, feature film of 1976, called San Babila 8 p.m., uh, San Babila 8 часов in Russian. Uh, it was uh, about um, a group of uh, young neo-Nazi uh, kids, neo-Nazi students um, uh, in Milan, in Italy, who tried to suppress the communist movement, anarchist movement there, and it produced bloodshed and killing people. And it's very anti, actually, anti-fascist movement, anti-Nazi movement. But for suddenly for Soviet people, Soviet kids' imagination, it became a cult film in Chernivtsi, in Lviv, in Dnipropetrovsk, in Kyiv. Um, high school students fell in love with this film with images, you know, modern dressed young people who were neo-Nazi, by the way, following Mussolini with leather jackets. Uh, KGB actually um, compared this uh, film, uh, film called to Sina Slaveni Visni. 17 moments of, um, uh, of uh, spring when uh, uh, followers of neo-Nazis in Soviet Union um, uh, explained that they were fascinated with images of clean, um, uh, you know, uh, Nazi in, 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 the, in the film about Soviet spy, uh, 17 moments of, uh, of, um, um, of uh, the spring. But for KGB, it was a more dangerous trend after watching this one because they saw how people began uh, idealizing Mussolini, Hitler, young kids, uh, either high school um, students or freshmen. The first arrest was done in Chernivtsi in 1982, in November, uh, of these follows in cafe. They listened to Sex Pistols, uh, these kids, but also they had swastika, they uh, uh, explain to police that they live in mafia states and Soviet states and corrupt state. They need order and Mussolini and um, Hitler um, gave them this order uh, or this model of order. So uh, the same happened in 82, 83 in Dnipropetrovsk in Zaporizhia. Um, and, um, uh, but uh, what is more dangerous um, these uh, children, these high school students, uh, began um, idealizing Stepan Bandera and leaders of uh, Ukraine National Patriotic Movement. Um, and um, uh, these groups were arrested in Dnipropetrovsk and Chernivtsi in 82 and 83. So KGB was shocked and the KGB tried to organize these special operations against um, uh, these followers of punks. 
Um, and um, uh, they send the recommendation to Komsomol ideologists and they organize rail campaign in 83 in all major cities of Ukraine. Hundreds of young people were arrested, mostly high school students. They had nothing to do with fascism. Uh, and uh, some of them had nothing to do with um, uh, real punk rock music. Uh, but um, by mistake, uh, KGB officers and the um, uh, Komsomol ideologists uh, discovered uh, this uh, SS insignia in the names of um, uh, hard rock heavy metal bands like ACDC from Australia or KISS from the from, um, United States. Uh, Iron Maiden uh, was uh, immediately mentioned as, uh, you know, bestial uh, fascist band and so on. Even old bands like Black Sabbath were uh, banned by KGB and Council because of this imaginary connection to KGB. So by product of all this campaign was suppression of heavy metal music, mostly ACDC and KISS, which was uh, imagined as fascist music. KGB, uh, although found some resistance to these arrests, uh, many of uh, young Komsomol members who were arrested for being enthusiasts of KISS tried to explain that KISS organized by Jewish guys from America who has babushka from Odessa, Kakavi from Odessa, how Jewish guys could be fascist, uh, neo-Nazi. But um, uh, still, KGB didn't listen to them and uh, they uh, organized this series of uh, arrests. So 83, 84 was peak of this anti-pun campaign. In Dnipropetrovsk, for example, I wrote this in my previous book um, in uh, Rock and Roll in the Rocket City, they organized special meetings. Um, uh, it's like Stalinist meetings. And actually, uh, Kiev imitated later on, and Chernitz imitated uh, this um, uh, Nibiru's model. They organized these special public meetings in uh, huge spaces where uh, former heroes of World War II, uh, you know, participants of anti-fascist movement, like uh, Natalia Sarana in uh, Nibiru's in 83, uh, delivered speeches against these neo-Nazi, neo-fascists in uh, Dnipropetrovsk and Soviet Ukraine, uh, how we need to punish them. So as a result of all these campaigns um, in 83, 84, 85, well, that thousands of innocent children, just people who loved ACC and KISS were uh, blamed to be uh, Nazis and um, uh, they were fired. They were expelled from Komsomol, fired from the schools. And the uh, KGB discovered 20 of so-called punk fascist neo-Nazi uh, groups in uh, Soviet Ukraine in 82, 85. And only three or five of them had something um, neo-Nazi, you know, slogan, swastika, or... Uh, uh, real fascist uh, background behind them. So uh, eventually all these uh, children were released, but KGB discovered a dangerous reaction, rise of patriotism or nationalism among these children. They began reading uh, Ukrainian literature in the 80s and was actually beginning of Perestroika. And uh, they began reading Ukrainian history and many of them uh, starting as punk rock uh, follows or ACDC and KISS follows, eventually drifted into the direction of uh, patriotic movement of late 1980s. Moreover, another byproduct of this, um, of this repression, KGB actually regretted about this, was the series of anti-Moscow feelings among, especially among parents of those children who were punished for listening to this so-called fascist music. And um, uh, KGB discovered millions of letters by actually by very respectable people, engineers from Dnipropetrovsk, professors from Lviv, uh, even by KGB and militia, militia officers from Kyiv and uh, Zaporizhia about these uh, stupid persecutions of their children. And many of these uh, 
even KGB officers blamed in the stupid campaign um, uh, Moscow and Moscow leaders who tried to follow this uh, anti-fascist um, uh, uh, trend. I, I discussed, for example, a reaction from some of uh, Kyiv um, uh, KGB officers who could understand this. They understood a uh, real, you know, attempt to imitate neo-Nazi Stepan Bandera, but did not uh, those children who listened just uh, to this music and had nothing to do uh, to this film. Uh, but uh, uh, paradoxically, KGB discovered that how music and films uh, could be very dangerous. Um, another group of Amer uh, Italian films uh, was also inspiration for this Protestant movement among uh, Soviet Ukrainian children who suffered uh, through this anti-punk, anti-fascist campaign. Uh, beside the San Babila Eight Hours, uh, this Carlo uh, Lizzani film, another group of old films from the 70s inspired uh, these kids and the criticism of Soviet state. Uh, those films were popular in the 70s and made by Damiano Damiani, Italian filmmaker. They were films about Italian mafia. We had tons of them. And they were praised by KG, praised by ideologists, but they were used by Soviet children now in the 80s to justify their position to mafia state. They blame Soviet Union to be mafia state, uh, Communist Party is mafia group, and so on. And uh, again, as in case of hippie, uh, KGB officers discard another more dangerous and more real sweat attempt not only to criticize Soviet state, but also to create a, some kind of alternative groups. And some of these groups uh, eventually in late 80s united in Ukraine, both hippies and punks, uh, so-called neo-hippies, of course, of the 80s, in the new massive patriotic movements. And these young people, many of them were arrested and harassed by the KGB for listening of this so-called forbidden music, eventually become a group of those people who would fight for independent Ukraine. But unfortunately, the legacy of Soviet Union, of Soviet tradition, still existed in, uh, in different forms, including KGB, SBU, form, for example, and um, other institutions. And uh, we need to remember that even now in independent Ukraine, unfortunately, we still have sometimes this Soviet nostalgia used by various politicians for a different way. And they need to go to KGB archives and see a damage done by this system to millions of Soviet young people who try to just enjoy their time and um, to have fun and who were punished for this innocent pursuit. Thank you very much. Now I'm ready for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Sergey. Yes, we can uh, proceed to our Q&A uh, session. Uh, please leave your comment in our uh, Q&A uh, option. Or if you would like to um, address Sergey directly, please uh, let Annie know and she will open that uh, option for you. Uh, while we were waiting for uh, the comments, um, I would like to uh, ask you this question about the participants um, of these uh, movements. You did mention that primarily those were um, university students or high school students, but uh, I'm wondering uh, who had access to all those materials which you described as dangerous. And the reason I'm asking this question is because of your previous book, Soviet Americana, uh, where you are very, um, in a very detailed manner, describe uh, how this um, participation or access uh, to the materials uh, in this um, United States, for example, 
could change the way young people were thinking. But uh, among those people that uh, you mentioned in the book were also children of what we can call today political elite, Soviet political elite. So who are those participants who um, actively participated in these um, movements, um, hippie movements and um, uh, punk movements? Yeah, uh, demographically, uh, from the social uh, point of view, uh, majority of um, the first hippies through entire Soviet Union, uh, Moscow, Kiev, uh, uh, Tallinn, were members of elites. The mm -hmm. same with Silagi. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, this, uh, uh, my major points, which I used to criticize Julian and uh, Bill Rich, because they sometimes exaggerate their influence. Punks were different. Punks were just high school and Petru students. So it's massive. Uh, again, uh, for hippie movement, you need to be more sophisticated. You need to read the literature. You need to know Krishnaites. You need to know Buddhists. You need to know Christianity. You need to know many things. Uh, read, read. For That's why I mentioned this San Babila 20 hours, because even KGB was shocked that this, well, it's not very good film, frankly speaking. Damiano Damiani Mafia films is much better. I, I, I watched this recently, it's a boring film, but it's violent. Uh, but again, you need to remember an effect of cultural fixation. Uh, when you live, it's old theory, uh, anthropological theory, which I use for rock and roll my, in, uh, in Rocket City. When you use in closed society, you develop cultural fixation of things, not just on music. And all these um, uh, dresses of these neo-Nazi, you know, uh, leather jackets, um, uh, jeans, uh, these black, they will look like perfect ideal type for these hungry kids who had nothing like this. And this was direct result of closeness of Soviet society. That's why it was more massive. But talking about massive movement of uh, hippie, I agree with um, Bill. Bill uh, Rich tried to persuade me that in the 80s, so-called neo-Nazi, is my term, neo-hippie neo was different, was more massive. It was more democratic, more white. Um, well, because uh, um, Perestroika opened uh, borders. We had Zgliad uh, uh, television show. We had Doi Posi Palunci television show where we saw all these groups, including, by, by the way, Sex Pistols uh, and uh, The Clash. So it's it's paradox that uh, now these young kids um, had uh, uh, this um, uh, available official information. Even Even the first hippies actually using not only tapes, but also officially released by Melodia, songs by the Beatles, the Animals, Korean Sky Water Revival, all this is found. I still have this collection, which I bought in uh, kiosks uh, at my, my school for 60 copies of uh, uh, Rubo. <laughs> it was available for everyone, not just for elites. And I, I, you know, I, I can call myself, you know, elite. My mom, I, I, my parents were divorced, so I grew up in the family of a uh, librarian for 60 rubles. That's why I, I play music to make money as a DJ. I probably made more money for one gig than for an entire uh, year of stipend. But anyway, um, uh, but again, even my uh, class of people, we lower class, you know, we, we read, we read. It's uh, only one difference, we read a lot. Um, but still, we had no money like these KGB kids who had access to ACDC records. My first ACDC records came from KGB friend. Well, he has father who was a spy in Hungary who brought all this. You know, it's a paradox. Uh, these um, uh, KGB people who persecuted us and uh, tried to suppress brought it for their children their, these forbidden records, which we then used, like ACDC and KISS records. But you're right. Um, the first, um, the first um, movement of, uh, or imitators uh, of sorry, hippies were most elite. And this is my difference with Julian and the uh, Bill who try, you know, to, um, uh, to idealize um, uh, this movement. My point is not about numbers. Probably 172 
uh, Kiev students is not big number like uh, people who lived in San Francisco in the 60s. But uh, the influence uh, attempt to distance themselves from political system, mafia state like these uh, punks kids and told this. It's, it was dangerous. And again, I will try to emphasize in this book these two geopolitical crises. One, uh, Czechoslovakian event, 68, and then Polish event. Uh, they, they were fundamental for undermining um, not only Soviet system, but our Soviet mind. I remember my own reaction to Polish events. I was, you know, patriotic guy who listened to John Lennon because John Lennon was anti-capitalist. <laughs> you know, uh, I listened to Clash because Clash was anti-capitalist. I listened to Sex Pistols because they uh, challenged uh, Queen, they uh, challenged uh, capitalism. Not because I was pro-capitalist, pro-American. And they loved American leadership because they criticized, like Mark Twain, criticized um, capitalism or Henry. But uh, um, you know, when I saw these events in Poland, I had a question. Uh, then uh, Afghanistan, uh, just recently, I had this question: Why this happened? Why um, local police tried to beat these people? And, and and you know, eventually, if you saw, if you've seen Andrzej Wider films about these events, you see this great. But for us, we had this just official information, and I had question I asked my mom I asked my my friends and it was the first actually time when many Soviet people were losing even patriots their belief in our system it's like Cuban revolution of 5960 uh, gave a boost of, to our system we saw that we are not just corrupt you know guys who killed people and we saw that Cuba produce the same, you know, this romanticism. And this inertia of romanticism probably lasted until the end of 60s. But uh, the first crisis of um, Czechoslovakia, uh, well, again, I was too young to understand this. Uh, I grew up in the 70s, but I remember these films. Uh, I remember I uh, watched film Shitty Mich. Uh, you remember this about um, this uh, Soviet spies, actually Putin's favorite film. And uh, before this film, we had Kronika, uh, you know, chron uh, news reels from um, Czechoslovakia. And I saw Swastika. And major comment was, oh, these guys in Czechoslovakia produce fascism. They financed by American imperialism to produce fascism and the Soviet. So, can you imagine my, uh, my reaction? Oh, it's bad. It's fashion and uh, America. But when I grew up, I realized that it's wrong. Uh, it was purely socialist movement. It was not pro-capitalist movement. Movement in Czechoslovakia was for socialism, for reforming socialism, creating more attractive image of socialism. No connection to CIA, nothing. Can we could not find this, and I, I have these facts. No, it was purely emotional. Yes, they use rock and roll, but rock and roll as anti imperialist, anti capitalist music. It was the same, and they eventually were punished for their socialism by their friends, by Shalist and Andropov. Actually, paradoxically, Shalist, who now it's idol for many Ukrainian patriots, was actually a bad figure for this and, uh, and you can find a lot of his documents signed by him. He, he, was, he was afraid of rock and roll, he was afraid of uh, Proxman, he was of everything. They were afraid of repetition of this. But again, it's a mistake. It was a purely socialist, peaceful movement. Um, it's the same with uh, Solidarność. Solidarność was working class movement, this paradox. And for me, it was shocked. You know, um, I, uh, I was, you know, council member and I asked my communist friends, I was already uh, at the end of my uh, cycle in uh, um, undergraduate school in Dnipropetrovsk University. And I asked, well, this is purely 
Solidarność movement with people. Uh, nobody, you know, it's a working class movement which, which was not sponsored by CIA and they could not uh, enter. So you need to understand that um, these two movements became trigger for all these campaigns. Not imitation of hippies or punks. No, they didn't care. They, they did care about danger of repetition of these events in Soviet Ukraine. I'll but you're right, initially hippies were not massive, but in the 80s it was different. Uh, I'll try to combine two questions uh, in uh, this um, uh, comment. So, um, in your presentation you mentioned that at some point KGB was, um, uh, the KGB realized that music and films can be dangerous, which is true and I can see why. However, way before the 60s, 70s and to the 80s more so, uh, the Soviet cinematography was extensively used tool of propaganda. So one could have guessed that probably those materials could be dangerous. So uh, why um, that sort of revelation uh, became some surprise or they realized that uh, films from abroad could be uh, dangerous? Is that because uh, some of the um, um, uh, employees uh, were not quite uh, well um, uh, aware of the cultural differences? No, KGB uh, KGB was always aware of these uh, influences. Um, uh, I did not uh, look through documents before this, but, uh, but it's obviously, look at their uh, propaganda, propaganda, how they used Charlie Chaplin films, uh, because it was anti-capitalist, it was anti-capitalist message. No, no, they understood. Um, I, I don't want to portray KGB as, you know, stupid, bad guys. No, no, no. It's not true. They they realized this. Uh, frankly speaking, I, I, I plan to, but it's I had only 40 minutes. I plan to start with a very interesting material, which I found. It's material, um, image of Soviet students of 1960. It was made in 67, but was reported to Shellist in 68. It's KGB material, and they produce uh, social picture of Soviet students at Odessa uh, with racism, anti-Semitism, uh, this anti-Ukrainian feelings, uh, how they hated um, African students, but at the same time, how they followed, how they hated communists, by the way, 67, can you imagine? And these are students, official, you know, great undergraduate students um, in, from Odessa. And they discussed how they, for example, idealized character from Magnificent Seven, Chris, how they, and they created this you know, cult of hero. And already in 67, they found idealization of Aryan man, Aryan boy, Ariski Tip. Even by some, it's again, paradox, by some Jewish guys. It's paradox, but it's true. So, um, no, they, they were aware of this, but again, it's a result of uh, so-called paradoxes of culture consumption. If you live in, uh, uh, again, you can imagine, for example, how Beatlemania could be produced by, by four talented, but people who use different material, not their own, to come to America. And they produce shock in America, playing American material, but American, America is um, a very racist in those days, especially the country. And they played uh, black music, but they were playing for white audience and playing like white European musicians. And this is another, you know, paradox of racial relations in the West, which produced eventually Bitlamania, British invasion, and rise of rock and roll, um, which uh, nobody expected the rock and roll could be uh, music for civil rights movement. Um, listen to uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, uh, Unfortunate Son. That's why KGB supported Creedence, because it was anti-war, anti-Vietnam war group in the imagination. So this is paradoxes of cultural consumption. We can't predict, especially in massive society. Well, look at what happened now with this Black Lives Matter. Nobody expected that this, um, you know, uh, social media thing, this, you know, telephone 
could produce this revolution. This is producing a revolution. The same with tapes. KGB, who were aware of um, uh, dangers of culture consumption, could not be, uh, you know, could not anticipate that tapes, uh, music tapes, could produce a revolution. You're right. It started with elites. But after elites came to us, to ordinary people who had no money, but who, who would have tapes borrowed from the France to listen. <laughs> and this is produced actually the end of Soviet system. You can't stop this. So the same with, with the United States. Uh, now social media destroying traditional forms of uh, interconnections, uh, dialogue. You know, it produced very bad result in diminishing of professional journalism. You know, uh, people stop reading good magazines and newspapers. They reading they scrap. Excuse me, this um, what they have found on social media. The same with uh, with uh, music. Uh, KGB never expected that people from elites began listening to the scrap. They call the scrap dirmo. I'm not an official doctor. And when uh, brothers of Sherbitsky were involved in listening to this music, for, the, for them, this is show how people who listen to classical music could produce this following of hippies and so on. So it's, it's another paradox of culture consumption. You're right, it's, we can predict KGB with all their brains, with they using very talented people, could not predict what happened. Look at the Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl, well, before Chernobyl, for example, I, I was very pro Soviet. After Chernobyl, I became anti Soviet. You know, I spent three months in zonas. And for me, it was shock. I realized everything which I believe was wrong. Moscow is wrong. So it's, it's, you know, this is paradox of our life. And that's why we can, that's why I love history. In history, you can't predict, you can't, like in physics or chemistry. But sorry. Mm -hmm. We have two more comments. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'll read the first one uh, from Yuan Ming. I was surprised at the connection you made between the solidarity movement and punk movement uh, music in Poland. Rock music, not just punk, indeed exploded in Poland in the 1980s, but was not perceived as related to solidarity. Solidarity ha had its own music closer to protest songs and traditional Polish songs. Of course, Rock music was a gesture of rebellion, but a very different type of rebellion than solidarities and um, generationally marked, while so solidarity was cross-generational. Could you comment on the 1980s yes. in the context of different types of music companies? Yeah, it's, it's a very, very good comment. But again, we're talking about KGB campaigns, KGB feelings, KGB imagination. They were afraid of these movements as early as 67 when Prague Sprint started. And uh, in uh, 1707, 79, we have three or four very, well, apparent, very anti Soviet uh, punk rock bands, Czechoslovakia, not in Poland, you're right, but in Czechoslovakia and in uh, Yugoslavia. And um, this produced this connection in imagination of KGB offices between rock music and politics. So when events of Solidarność started, it took the same imaginary chain of this development. And uh, all these, for me, it was crazy, you know, comments by KGB officers, they were afraid of repetition of Solidarność. And they found this uh, threat in these new rock musical trend. Of course, uh, people who listen to Solidarność, uh, uh, well, who became active in Solidarność, grew up listening to Bob Dylan, John Bias, to um, progressive rock, very different, very different tradition. They were old enough. Or, or even a younger generation listened to a very different type of uh, rock music, a new wave. Again, it's related to punk. But still, um, in Soviet Ukraine, the, those operatives had very different perception of these events. And for them, I already mentioned how they mixed punk and heavy metal. ACDC and KISS had nothing to do with punk. 
it's very different. Uh, punk rock was a reaction to all these pompous, you know, heavy metal, uh, stadium rock band like Queen, Deep Purple, Nazareth, Led Zeppelin, uh, ACDC, and so on. Punk was a reaction to this because they hated these capitalists in rock music. They hated these um, hard rock bands like the Purple and so on and the Queen. But uh, again, these offices in Kiev just related, they had no clue about these studs, they just related this to symbolic influence. Uh huh. We see SS and KISS, we see again this sign in ACDC, although it was not as it. Well, these are fascists, that's it. And they send this recommendation to uh, Komsomol ideologists who sometimes knew better than the KGB supervisors, it's not true, but they uh, follow this. So this was KGB reaction and attempt to stop the danger of rock and roll in form in 80s punk rock form. So I agree, yes, but again, I'm writing not about real punk rock movement in Solidarność. I'm writing about reactions in Soviet Ukraine from 68 to 85. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yona Nizhinska made a comment that makes sense from the KGB perspective. Uh, thank you, Sergei. And maybe we can proceed to our next comment. Um, yes, there's a comment by Helena Goldberg. I'll just read it really quick. Um, Historically, when a particular style of music is rejected for ideological reasons, it is not unusual to see aesthetic arguments made to justify this rejection. Too loud, too dissonant, too noisy. Have you come across arguments like this in your research made by people in power? Okay, well, it's a good comment. But, but again, um, uh, I, I, I try to explain why even today, um, again, it will be in uh, epilogue at the end of my book, how these old threads of fascism, neo-Nazis and so on, still, revived by politicians uh, for explaining their own goals. Like Putin regime explained, for example, role of these Okean Elza and you know, other crazy bands of this um, Belarusian um, band, like Voine Sveta, Voine. Anyway, uh, uh, look at how, uh, for example, Russian regime reacted to events in Ukraine in uh, 1315 and events in Belarus. It's the same explanation. Fascism, um, these fascist crazy guys from Ukraine. But th this uh, discourse of fascism uh, was appropriated by a Soviet regime as early as 1919 and uh, uh, read uh, Lenin's uh, criticism of development in, in uh, e e Italy in 1918. He found these uh, roots of very dangerous destruction of working class movement in Mussolini fascist squad. So you can find this as early as Lenin. And then it was used by all Lenin's successes, finishing with Putin. Read uh, Stalin's speeches against Bukharin, uh, Trotsky, all of them fascists. <laughs> And read what the Russian media called the uh, Ukrainians, uh, it means Jewish fascists. It's, it's, it's nonsense. And that's why I gave you the example of Kiss. Uh, when uh, uh, DJ was arrested, he told the KGB guy, so these guys are Jewish. Babushka <laughs> from Odessa, how they could be fascists. We know better than you was KGBX. So the same with, uh, with uh, today's reaction in, in Moscow. I think we have enough time for uh, one more question. Um, I can go if you don't mind. So um, you mentioned that there were um, arrests of these uh, students, school students, university students. I'm not sure how large scale they were, but um, my question is um, what was the uh, uh, procedure uh, of events after the arrests. What was the um, 
what was the KGB trying to ah, do? Was uh, it kind uh, of a... Very bad. They sent immediately two letters. One to administration of their college or school, and another letter to uh, council organization. So uh, even if they were released next day or in 15 days, usually in 15 days afterwards, uh, only some of them got uh, terms for months and years, for example, for swastika or for uh, criticism, open criticism of mafia stance, some of this. But majority of them were released immediately. But can you imagine you lost your position in Kamsamo and you lost position in your school? So you go to work either in Kalhoz, Kalatifam, or na Nazavod, to factory. So the, the, uh, you need to uh, understand it was more dangerous than its entire career was ruined. And if you live in Soviet Union, I remember my mom, I, I just give you just one example. Um, I had connection to a band which played for local uh, Baptist sect in Yurkovka, uh, it's uh, near uh, my hometown, Vatutina and Zvinyarodka region. Uh, Natalia knows this uh, area, district um, of Cherkas region. And this band where I, I, I was helping with, uh, I was not a musician, I was just helping them, uh, was stopped by um, militia and it was reported to KGB because we uh, this group played for a religious gathering. This inspired my first book, which Natalia did mention, Russia's Lost Reformation about evangelicals and Jews in Tsarist Russia. But anyway, um, uh, my mom told me after this, when we were you know, stopped, arrested, and harassed, uh, Sergei, do you want to go to university? Do you want these scandals? So I just stopped. I, I distanced myself because this year I uh, submitted my, my documents, including my Kamsamal, you know, characteristic to uh, Nipravos University. I, I, and I don't, don't, didn't want to, you know, to go to army settings <laughs> otherwise. So you need to understand that for our generation, these arrests were more dangerous than, you know, one year in a prison because letter to Kamsamal and to your college administration is the end. Uh, and uh, I'm still thinking about your closing remarks about, uh, well, or about your closing uh, part of your presentation, where you were talking about uh, how these uh, young people who were interested in punk uh, movements and hippie movements uh, became interested in some national ideas. So how that transformation from the interest in Western cultures uh, changed into some interest uh, in uh, national nationalistic um, movements and ideas. Yeah, it's it's a parad again it's a paradox of culture consumption. Today again, I have I, I have no time for this. Um, I just came from a class where we talked about Bitlamania and rise of nationalism in Soviet Ukraine, and what we did, we played um, uh, Venus by Chopin Blue and covered by Venus called Zaporizhsky Kozaki, which became a popular hit in early 70s everywhere, from Cherkasy to Kiev, from Chernivtsi to Lviv, from Lviv to Simferopol. And it was in, in, in Ukrainian, and it was Kazakh, Zaporizhsky Kazakhi, Turki Pridut, and we against Turkish oppression, against Polish, against Russian oppression. So this is a paradox uh, how Beat song by Dutch band Shocking Blue, Venus. You know, uh, uh, you got it. It's, it's, it's uh, who'd become national anthem. And KGB guilty, I found documents of KGB who supported playing the song when finally discovered some versions which were anti Russian. Ruski Vsik Pubyut, Voskali Pubyut. And this is another paradox. KGB, and we explain this with my students, discuss this in my class. That's why I love, still love in past the class with Mess, but still. Uh, how KGB used this song to fight English American songs, but eventually they realized the song is cover of song in English, shocking blue, and the song provoked anti Russian, pro Ukrainian feelings among millions of kids from Cherkasy 
to Chemnitsi. Well, probably uh, I, I, I will, I, I will uh, actually after this, I will uh, send you a link with uh, Ukrainian Kazakh, the Polish Kazakh. So you will recognize, and then I send you send you link with winners by Shukin Blue. This is a paradox of this. I, I couldn't understand how these um, hippies could be. Uh, I found, for example, a um, picture of um, uh, people who imitated Indian culture. Uh, uh, Andrei Znaminsky sent me this, who used a uh, uh, sign of Trizubits, uh, Trizub, in early 80s. And they were uh, representative of another popular culture, not hippies, not punks, but very close to hippies, imitators of American Indians. And they had their image. And they were from Sifiropol, Russian-speaking Ukrainian patriots. How you can explain this? I'm Russian-speaking, can't speak. Uh, so this is another paradox, how young people could be emotional, especially these hippies who fell in love with Shevchenko. Shevchenko for them, my generation, Shevchenko for us, was our Ukrainian John Lennon, frankly speaking. Because I grew up in a bedroom uh, before I went to Dnipro Girls, where I had two pictures, Tara Shevchenko and Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles. So this mixture, and my mom is Russian, Kachitkova speaking, but she's loved you, or everything Ukrainian. So this is another um, case of so-called paradoxes of cultural consumption. That's why this topic is it's a wonderful topic for any researcher classical music, rock music, whatever you want. Or Gogol, uh, <laughs> uh, fixation on Gogol. And uh, Gogol became, uh, Gogol Bardello, recent punk band, <laughs> using the name of uh, Gogol, for example. But anyway, I, I stopped. Well, thank you so much, Sergei. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. And I would like to wish you good luck on uh, the uh, book, which is in progress. Uh, yeah, and I still, I still fight it because, uh, and again, I'm traveling. I, I actually commuted between Ukraine and Dnipro, so it's a Dnipro, so it's very difficult. Well, hopefully <laughs> we'll uh, get together again and we'll discuss your uh, new book which I believe will be a very um, valuable contribution to the reimagination of not only what we know about Soviet Ukraine, but also about how we remember Soviet Ukraine. And yes, like you uh, mentioned in the end of your talk, uh, there is some nostalgia uh, about the Soviet Union, but I would say it, it's even more unfortunate that on official levels, this nostalgia sometimes- No, no, I, I realize, I realize this, yeah, you're right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kate. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Today, so he leave, yeah? presented his talk, The KGB versus Youth Culture, A Story of Hippies and Punks in Soviet Ukraine. Thank you for attending our lecture today, and please join us next Tuesday. Information about upcoming events will be posted on the Ukrso listserv and on our Facebook page, Ukrainian Studies Organization at Indiana University. You can also view previous lectures and talks on our YouTube channel, and for future events that we will post, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you.